Good morning. My name is Jan Carson, and I'm the Interim Executive Director of the ACLU of Oregon. <clears throat> Today we filed a new lawsuit against the City of Portland brought in Multnomah County Circuit Court on behalf of Michelle Fawcett for the battery committed against her by the Portland police when they shot her in the chest and arm with a flashbang grenade while she was peacefully protesting against bigotry and intolerance on August 4th, 2018 in downtown Portland. We are seeking $250,000 in damages for Ms. Fawcett. This is one of eight lawsuits we are filing on behalf of protesters in Portland who have been injured by police or illegally detained. We thank our cooperating attorneys at Tonkin Torp for their work on these cases. All of their work on behalf of our clients is being done pro bono. The peaceable assembly that Michelle Fawcett participated in was met with excessive force as Portland police officers in riot gear used military grade munitions on the crowd. These deadly weapons are meant to be shot overhead, but the police instead fired them directly into groups of innocent people. As a result of this reckless and excessive use of force, Ms. Fawcett suffered third degree chemical burns, major impact wounds, and major soft tissue damage, as well as mental and emotional distress. Ms. Fawcett is permanently injured. She sought and continues to need medical treatment. She has missed work, has experienced pain and suffering, and has been both depressed and afraid to leave her home because of the trauma she experienced. She no longer feels safe to exercise her right of peaceful assembly and free speech. At this point, I'd like to invite Michelle to share her thoughts on what happened to her and this lawsuit. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Michelle Fawcett. On August 4th, 2018, the Portland police shot me in the chest and arm with a flashbang grenade while I was peacefully protesting. I, like many Oregonians, was deeply saddened and frightened when Jeremy Christian, weeks after attending a Patriot prayer rally, killed two people on the max, severely wounded another, and tormented two young women because of their race and their perceived religious beliefs. When I heard that Patriot prayer was coming back to Portland yet again, I knew I would have to be part of the peaceful counter protest. Even though I was afraid that Patriot prayer and Proud Boys <clears throat> excuse me, attendees would instigate street violence as they are known to do, I felt that it was my duty to stand against violence, bigotry, and hatred in our community. And I wasn't alone. Hundreds of peaceful counter-protesters gathered that day to show up for our Portland values of inclusion and to call for an end to violence and hateful rhetoric. Looking around that day and seeing so many of my fellow Portlanders, I felt proud of Oregon and hopeful. But things changed in a moment. Despite being in the middle of the protest, I heard an ear-splitting explosion and was knocked back with a high-velocity impact. Suddenly, I was overcome with searing pain in my chest and arm and an intense burning sensation. I was dazed and frightened, and I knew right away that something terrible had happened to me. I looked down at my arm, and it was completely white for an instant before deep red blood started rising up to the surface. Everyone around me was scattering to seek cover, so I too turned, grabbed my arm, and crouching down, started trying to run away. I ran the rest of the block before someone near me started shouting, medics. <clears throat> Uh, but more and more explosions uh, kept booming all around me, one after another. So the medics helped me to continue to run for safety. It felt like a war zone, and I wondered if I would survive. By the time we found shelter behind a concrete wall, my arm was so swollen it looked broken. The medics poured water over it and wrapped it in a bandage, but it was clear to everyone that I needed to get to a hospital as soon as possible. The emergency doctor did not know what could have caused these wounds. I remember her Googling to try to figure out what this device could have been so that she could appropriately treat me. She said, had I been in Iraq or Afghanistan, she might be able to figure out 
what the chemicals were. She couldn't believe this was happening on a Saturday afternoon in downtown Portland. These unknown chemicals caused third degree chemical burns in addition to major impact wounds and soft tissue damage. I would later come to learn that I had been hit by a flash bang grenade launched directly into the crowd by a police officer. I still have an imprint of the device in my arm. The flashbang grenade caused a complicated injury and my recovery has been slow and painful. And that is only the physical part. I have nightmares. I startle at any unexpected uh, noise or touch. I'm constantly on edge, jumping out of my seat. I no longer feel safe in my community. I no longer feel safe in the presence of law enforcement. I no longer feel safe near crowds of people. No one should have to feel this way. If someone attacks you, you report it. You go through official channels to get a response. But in this case, it was the police that attacked me, so what can I do? The police are supposed to protect and serve, but instead they shot me and other peaceful protesters with military grade weapons. Then, police chief outlaw went on the radio saying that people like me came with bad intentions to this event. So we got our butts kicked by the police and now we're just whining and complaining about it. The thought of this fills me with a deep sense of despair. I'm not sure where I can get justice. I was not the only person who was severely injured that day. We are lucky, truly lucky, that no one was killed. So what I've realized is in order to seek justice and stop this from happening to anybody else, I have to be part of a lawsuit. I am grateful that the ACLU of Oregon and Tonkin Torp have taken my case, but I have to say that it's hard for me to put myself in the spotlight like this. Anyone who knows me knows I value privacy, but at this critical time, I realized that I must do, and we all must do, what we can to ensure that people are free to gather together to exercise our First Amendment free speech rights, to reject racism, to reject violence, and to reject the rising tide of white nationalism and authoritarianism in our country and right here in our community. I believe in equality, in justice and self-determination. I believe all people should be treated fairly. I believe the police should not shoot weapons and chemicals into innocent protesters. I hope this lawsuit brings about changes to the way that Portland handles protest before anyone else is heard. Thank you. Michelle, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your courage. Thank you. Um, before we open this up to questions, I just wanted to share a few more thoughts. The Portland Police Bureau's response to protesters is frequently militarized and dangerous. This has had a chilling effect on free expression, free speech, and free assembly. People seriously injured by the use of so-called crowd control weapons by Portland Police. We acknowledge that tensions are high in the city. The upcoming anti-Antifa protest on August 17th will be another test for the Portland Police Bureau as white nationalists again converge on our city. We will not attempt to downplay the challenges we are currently facing as a city, a state, as a nation. We share the concerns of many about the rise of hateful rhetoric, violence, and racism. Law enforcement's job is to facilitate First Amendment activity, including those activities by counter-protesters, by enabling peaceful protest, addressing violence when it occurs, and managing loud, large crowds to promote safety for everyone. Police should actively use techniques designed to de-escalate the potential for violence. We know that the most successful policing of protests focuses on de-escalation and crowd management rather than on crowd control. Police response needs to be proportional to what has occurred or is occurring. Officers 
need to be mindful that crowd control measures can often be counterproductive and escalate rather than lower risks to public health, safety, and welfare. Furthermore, at the August 4th protests last year, and at many others, Portland police have appeared to be biased against leftist counter-protesters. This has harmed the Bureau's relationship with community and contributed to, rather than curbed, the rising violence on our streets. The current militaristic tactics and excessive force have clearly escalated situations, putting both officers and the public at risk. At the same time that officers have largely ignored street fighting and assaults between protesters, they have frequently used the actions of a few protesters as justification <coughs> for firing weapons and chemicals at large groups of people, creating chaos and resulting in severe injuries, like what happened to Michelle Fawcett. I would like to be very clear about the ACLU of Oregon's position. Law enforcement can address violence if and when it occurs. Law enforcement must respond to isolated incidents of property damage, violence, or other lawlessness by arresting individuals responsible, not breaking up a protest. We have previously shared this information and much more with the city through reports, policy directive comments, and direct testimony. We also created a volunteer legal observer team to document police protester interactions. And our observers themselves have been tear gassed, shot with rubber ball grenades, and unlawfully detained in a kettle. We all must push Portland to improve its police practices. To our knowledge, no other police force in America uses crowd control weapons with the regularity of the Portland Police Bureau. Thank you, and we can open it up for some questions now. Um, it takes a while to pull together the information necessary. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, just mostly trying to make sure that we're prepared. Um, Michelle, it's, you know, it's a big decision, as she said. Um, I don't want to speak for her about that. Jeff, I don't know if you've got any particular answer. Sure. My name's Jeff Bradford. I'm an attorney with Tonkin Torp, and we're grateful to be partnering with the ACLU to be bring this lawsuit. Uh, as was just suggested, it does take some time to put this information together to develop the necessary facts and to uh, come to a conclusion about the right time. As it happens, this is very close to the anniversary of the event uh, that's alleged in the complaint. And we felt that that would be an appropriate time uh, to bring this lawsuit. Uh, it gave us an opportunity to uh, get to know Michelle, to thoroughly investigate the facts, and to prepare ourselves to do litigation with the city. Uh, we know that from this point on that we'll have an opportunity to engage in discovery, and there'll be lots of things to, to happen, but we plan to aggressively pursue Michelle's case. And we assume that it will unfold in months, not years. Uh, Ms. Fawcett, if you wouldn't mind speaking to it, was there a moment over the last year that prompted you to come forward? Was there a single moment over the last year that prompted you to come forward? Um, I came forward pretty much right away in the sense of not, you know, I mean, being public, I had given interviews right after the event, even though it was extremely difficult for me. As you can imagine, I, I really couldn't even leave my house. So reporters had to come to my house to talk to me about it. And it was a really, really tough decision to be public, um, not just because I'm a very private person, but because of the climate that we live in. It felt um, extra scary because it didn't feel like the city was on my side or the police were on my side, and we're operating in a climate of this rising tide of uh, racist violence. I mean, just look at what happened this weekend with shootings around the country. Um, we're living in a really scary time, and so it was really hard for me to come out, but I have been public from the beginning and uh, sought legal help right away, but it's a difficult um, case. This is not a case of a random person on the street assaulting you. This is a case of the police bureau and the city uh, being responsible here. And so um, because of that, you know, we have to marshal all of the evidence that we can and, and be prepared and, um, you know, lawsuits take time. I never, I didn't know that because I've never been involved in anything like this, but these things take time to file and paperwork and, you know, different things that have to happen. So um, it's finally coming together now and, um, you know, yesterday was the one year anniversary 
Uh, so it's, um, you know, it's time to take the next step. And I, I just hope that we're successful in changing these, uh, these uh, attitudes and um, practices. Thank you. Has this, has this kept you from wanting to protest in the future? Or Absolutely. And that's really heartbreaking <laughs> because now is a time more than ever that we need to come out. And on that day, on August 4th, there were all kinds of people you know, kids and moms and, you know, people dressed up and singing and dancing, and it was a time to come together with the community. Um, you know, we're not going to change anything by sitting on our couch at home. I felt like doing that that day because I was afraid of the, the types of people that are coming here to, you know, incite violence and, and actually carry out violence. Um, so I was really relieved when I got there, and I just saw hundreds and hundreds, you know, maybe more than a thousand people on the counter-protester side peacefully standing against this. It feels very empowering to do that. And, you know, that's why it's called the First Amendment. I mean, it's the First Amendment because that is what we stand for here. We stand for the right to stand together and express our opinions. We, we are not, we don't want to live in a, in a society where we are shut down and oppressed and, you know, hurt and prevented from uh, expressing ourselves. So. Um, yeah, so it, I, I, I'm really sad that I, I just don't feel, I don't feel safe going out in these events, you know. Um, yeah, that's for your question. Yeah, well, I mean, I commend everyone for standing up and, and going out, just, just as I have. Um, I encourage everyone to come out. The more people come out, the more we can express our message of peace and, you know, equality, justice, self-determination, and solidarity. So, you know, we can't just have two or three people coming out for this. Um, please don't be afraid. I mean, I, I'm afraid because I was shot. But I really hope that the Portland Police uh, Bureau, that Chief Outlaw, that Mayor Wheeler, that the city will allow us to feel comfortable enough to come out. Because I do know people that are afraid to come out and stand again. And this is the exact time that we do need to come out. I mean, this is serious, serious, serious matters that are happening. I mean, people are being killed. There is a documented statistical rise in hate crimes and death. So we have to do all that we can to show that we stand against this. And if the city doesn't make it a safe place to do that, we're really in trouble. The city needs to stand on the side of First Amendment free speech. It needs to stand against this r brutal racist violence in our city. And with this protest coming next week, I, you know, I'm really concerned. question was, in addition to monetary damages, you know, what other action do we hope will result? Uh, just by way of clarification, this is a, a civil complaint that's being filed with uh, Multnomah County. And it's difficult to put any kind of number on the kind of pain and suffering that Ms. Fawcett has faced. Uh, there's a number of concerns that arise from the conduct of the Portland Police uh, on, on August 4th, 2018. Uh, as Michelle just shared, people should feel safe to exercise their First Amendment rights. And we do hope to see uh, long-term change in the way that police engage with uh, protesters. Um, here though, this isn't an academic pursuit for Ms. Fawcett. She actually has ongoing injuries, both physical and emotional. And so our effort is to make sure first that she receives fair treatment and that her case is heard and that the city is held to account. And from there, we hope that her case and those like it will affect long-term change. I, I think the other thing um, I would add is the ACLU of Oregon has been engaged with the city for, um, you know, years now. 
whenever there's an opportunity when they put out new police directives, which are kind of the policies that guide um, how police are going to act in any different in any variety of circumstances, we are offering our comments on those. We are testifying before city council when they have various ordinances up. Um, we uh, we are trying to engage with them um, and feel pretty frustrated that uh, the behavior of the police do, do, doesn't seem to change. And so um, we will continue um, down that avenue. We will continue to seek policy changes, but we also think that um, we need to try to bring this, uh, hold the city accountable for some of the injuries um, that have actually occurred at the hands of police at um, these primarily peaceful protests. Any other last questions? Well, I thank you all for coming, and um, here we go. <laughs>